At this time, I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker for the conference. Dr. Alan Jones is professor of history at Grinnell College. Professor Jones is an Iowan by birth, education, and residence. He was born in Newton, grew up in Tama, and went to college at Grinnell. He left the state momentarily to attend graduate school at the University of Michigan, where he received his PhD in 1960. He had earlier returned to Grinnell College in the Department of History, where he has taught various courses in American and European history, including a regular course in comparative urban history. He apologizes after a fashion for the quite rural perspective he has on cities and admits that on his several trips abroad during sabbaticals to study U European cities and new towns, he has preferred to live in quiet English villages observing cities at a distance. <laughs> Dr. Jones has been active in civic affairs in Grinnell, serving on the Grinnell City Council for five years in the 1960s, participating in local politics as a Democratic County Chairman, and as a citizen involved in questions of planning and zoning, low rent housing, recreation and parks, school bond elections, human rights commission, etc. We are pleased to have Dr. Jones address us today on the subject, The City is Dead, Long Live the City. Dr. Jones. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I apologize a bit for my rural perspective. And I, I guess uh, looking at future problems uh, from a purely historical perspective. Henry Ford thought history was bunk, but Henry Ford um, did have a sense of the future. Uh, in 1920, uh, surveying the future of his automobile, uh, he made the remark that, I can tell you one thing, the cities are finished. Um, he not only prophesied, he in part contributed to that problem. Well, in talking about the topic of this lecture uh, with some league people earlier in the year, I gathered the general topic would be, um, can the American city survive the 20th century? Uh, that has been um, quieted down a bit with the topic, uh, cities in transition, up or out. Uh, I think that the earlier way of putting that question is probably more appropriate. Uh, for the last 15 years, historians and economists and other social scientists concerned with urban problems have raised the question of whether the city as we know it, uh, not as we know it, I think, in Iowa or in Ames, but as we know it nationally and internationally, whether the city as we know it can survive the 20th century. The titles of their articles reveal this. Kenneth Boulding writes specifically of the death of the city. Melvin Weber writes of the post-city age. Others see the city lingering on in senile status in such articles as the city as sandbox or the city as reservation with its bureaucratic custodians. The title I like best is that of a young woman sociologist, Janet Abu Lugod, The City Is Dead, Long Live the City. Now, I've dealt with these questions in recent years in a course in urban history looking at American and European cities, a course, I might say, which has humanist rather than social science perspectives and which compares American to European cities, particularly London. I believe I understand the concern about the death of cities, and I will outline my views and values uh, along rather broad historical and humanist lines. That, I think, is one of the uh, guidelines the Iowa Humanities Grant Board sets for these appearances. Uh, and in those, along those lines, I think, it may be difficult to find practical uh, uh, solutions or guidelines to public policy and aims. Uh, 
hopefully, a humanist perspective uh, is not irrelevant uh, to those uh, immediate concerns. Cities are individual affairs, each with its own quality of uniqueness. They are also very much alike with similar patterns and similar problems. The historian has to look at them both ways, and I want to emphasize in the first instance the similarities between great cities, the patterns of change which they all seem to have undergone in the last two centuries, patterns which are often discussed as the process of urbanization. A rather innocuous phrase until one begins to examine it a little more closely from the perspective of the humanist. The process of urbanization is first of all a demographic process, a process of more and more people in the world and more and more of them concentrating in particular places. One can see the universal nature of this process by looking at some statistics. In 1800, only 3% of the world population was urban. In 1970, almost 50% of a much larger world population uh, was urban. That may not seem such a major change, but when you break it down to particular nations, the process of change is much greater. In 1800, a little over 10% of the 10, people, 10 million people of England could be called urban most of them in London. By 1900, 100 years later, 90% of a population of 40 million was urban. In the United States in 1870, 25% of 40 million was urban. In 1970, 75% of over 200 million was urban. In Iowa in 1870, 13% of 1.2 million was urban. In 1970, 57% of 2.8 million. These demographic changes have a deterministic uh, quality about them. They are phenomena which just seem to happen and go on happening, like lemmings going to the sea. They appear to be the result of social and historical forces too powerful for man to control. At least that is my first impression when I read of the projected population of Mexico City in the year 2000 at 32 million, or when I read low and high estimates of Calcutta in 2000 at 35 or 55 million. The same impression is present when I take a historical view and wonder what was the human impact of London growing from 900,000 to 4 million in the 19th century and then again from 4 million to 8 million between 1900 and 1940. Or when I look at the growth of Chicago from 112,000 to 2.2 million between 1860 and 1900, growing in one decade of the 1880s from a half a million to a million, a growth rate that occurs in New York City every decade approximately throughout the 19th century. These universal processes are still at work when one looks at the demographic shifts, uh, massive shifts, in older eastern and Midwe midwestern cities during the 1960s, cities which uniformly lost population, mostly white. St. Louis losing 20% of its population in those 10 years during the same period <coughs> Texas and California cities uniformly across the board increased their population by over 40% growth rates. Examining the statistics of these population movements of the, of the 60s uh, more carefully, one notices other things. St. Louis lost 20% of its population, a net loss of 150,000, really a loss of 250,000 because of black population increase in St. Louis. But the St. Louis standard metropolitan statistical area grew 11% from 2.1 to 2.3 million. The city of Chicago in the same decade lost uh, net 225,000 people or 6% of its population. Really, it lost 400,000 white people while gaining 
uh, about 200,000 non-whites. And the Chicago Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area increased 700,000 from 6.2 to 6.9 million. I don't want to bore you with these statistics, but I do want to repeat them to, to, to have you get the sense of, of their, their kind of uniform, uh, the uniform patterns of, of great demographic shifts occurring in American cities. The pattern I've talked about is evident in Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, New York City, and most other eastern and midwestern cities, including Des Moines, to a much lesser degree. The standard metropolitan statistical areas seem to be alive and well in the 1960s, uh, even though the cities were dying. These movements have continued in the 1970s uh, in older northeastern and midwestern cities in this country. Uh, uh, Chicago is said to be losing about 60,000 people a year in the 1970s. The most recent reports indicate that even the standard metropolitan statistical areas are beginning to lose population in the Midwest and the Northeast as a massive population shift uh, moves to uh, the Sun Belt states from San Clemente to uh, Key Biscayne. <laughs> the process of urbanization in its demographic aspects then poses central problems for a historian who believes that men make cities and that men make history, not unseen forces understood only as statistics. The process similarly uh, poses problems for the humanist who believes that the city is a human artifact, something created and built by men. And there are other patterns at forces at work in the process of urbanization which similarly seem to diminish man's possibility of creation and control. Closely connected to the process of urbanization, for instance, and acquiring momentum in the same way in the same years since 1800 is the process of industrialization. The connection between urbanization and industrialization is so close, or was so close in the 19th century, that many urban sociologists and historians simply divide the history of cities into three categories pre-industrial, industrial, and post-industrial. The crucial variable in the process of uh, industrialization and its effect on urbanization is the variable of technology. And some would account for the great demographic shifts of the last two centuries by simple reference to technological causes. Above all, changes in transportation, communication, and production technology. Certainly the great 19th century cities Manchester, Birmingham, Chicago, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and later Detroit, were industrial cities, cities of the age of steam whose factories produced goods with an infinitely specializing division of labor and which relied on railroads or steamships to bring raw workers or raw materials to them and which relied on railroads or steamships to send the finished goods out again to the corners of the world. 20th century technological change in transportation, communication, and production, the changes of an electric and post-industrial age, which substitutes electricity for steam, the internal combustion engine of cars and trucks for locomotives, the telephone, television, and computers for typewriters and telegraphs, these technological changes help account for such demographic shifts in U.S. cities as have been occurring in the last few decades. When the federal government alone, since 1945, spends $350 billion for highway development, the effect is evident in and around cities and helps explain the emergence of that confused, decentralized, post-industrial urban sprawl we call a standard metropolitan statistical area. The transportation technology of highways and motor cars and trucks, let alone airplanes, and I might say the great growth around Chicago centers in the Northwest O'Hare uh, region, uh, the transportation technology of highways and motor cars and trucks now determine, uh, determine where people live and where businesses are located, where new plants are built, 
where shopping centers develop, where new communities are formed, and where old communities die. This is evident at a glance in American cities, particularly California cities, uh, but it is a universal pattern present in Iowa, where the state spent $1.2 billion between 1964 and 74 on highways and helped create our fastest growing communities, Urbandale, West Des Moines, Clive, and Bettendorf. <clears throat> well, for the purpose of these remarks, I want to emphasize how technology like demography uh, uh, raise problems uh, for the historian and the humanist uh, when he looks at cities. Uh, technology, too, seems to be a force out of control, difficult to get leverage on, creating and destroying cities. The process of urbanization has then, with these two variables, a deterministic quality about it. And when one adds other variables, <coughs> which condition the life and death of cities, uh, one feels the great diminishing of uh, the possibility of maintaining cities or great cities as we know them. There are, for instance, interrelated class, ethnic, spatial, and environmental patterns that have the quality of, universal, of a universal process in the history of cities, and I will touch briefly on them. As London grew in the 18th and 19th century, a clear spatial pattern emerged, the West End and the East End. Wealth, education, culture, power, and civility in the East End, in the West End. Poverty, illiteracy, powerlessness, and violence in the East End. And neighborhoods differentiated themselves along these lines in American cities uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, even more so because of the quite uniquely American experience of immigrants and blacks. This process continues to the present. Those demographic and technological patterns evident in the 1960s that I talked of earlier are reinforced by a process in which the older central cities of the East and Midwest are marked by poverty and powerlessness unemployment and welfare, poor schools, poor housing, disorder, crime, and blackness. And the new suburbs of the standard metropolitan statistical areas are marked by wealth and power and good schools and good health and good housing and relative order and whiteness. Race and racism, perhaps, is the most significant determinant at work in contemporary American urbanization. But once again, a deterministic pattern, at this point, uh, cultural, social, uh, rather than technological or simply demographic, emerges in every vital statistic about cities and suburbs, uh, controlling and limiting the prospect of human choice and action, constraining historical possibility. And these patterns are evident in Iowa with our west sides and our east sides and our north sides and our south sides. Uh, not terribly evident, but pretty clear in Waterloo. In the process of American urbanization, there has been one other rather unique constraining uh, force, a cultural force that can be called privatism, as Sam Bass Warner calls it in his book, The Private City, a book which treats Philadelphia as a model of American cities. Our cities in general <coughs> have lacked <coughs> the historical tradition of European cities, a tradition dating from pre-industrial patterns of community and civility, a tradition of civic humanism most evident in places like uh, Florence and London. Most of our cities are 19th century cities. They're industrial cities. Uh, they grow in a century of individualism, a century of economic uh, uh, expansion, a century <clears throat> of technological change, a century of free enterprise capitalism, and of the free private market. As Warner remarks, <clears throat> under the American tradition, the first purpose of the citizen is the private search for wealth. 
the goal of a city is to be a community of private money makers. From the first moment of bigness, from about the mid-19th century on, the successes and failures of American cities have depended upon the unplanned outcomes of the private market. The private market's demand for workers, its capacities for dividing land, for building houses, stores, and factories, and its needs for public services have determined the shape and the quality of America's big cities. As individuals, Americans have been privatistic, and so have our cities. Warner's views have been echoed in a new book by the historian Richard Sennett, a book aptly called The Fall of Public Man, uh, for whom privatism is sort of the narcissism of our society in the 1970s. Like Warner, Sennett laments the tradition of privatism, a tradition long supported by American public policy, supported by public land policy, by tax policy, by housing policy, by transportation policy, a policy long supported by planning and zoning commissions. Privatism is a tradition of values and beliefs close to what most of us understand as the American way of life. It is a tradition, I might say, in evidence in the discussion of planning in this evening's Ames Daily Tribune. Privatism has replaced the idea of a community where men have a secure and common life together in a humane environment with the idea of a city as a private market for privatistic individuals. Most American cities in the 19th century and most American cities today continue with the quality of booster projects. City builders have traditionally been land speculators and real estate developers. Now, in the late 20th century, when the old cities, buffeted by demographic, technological, racial, and environmental forces, have deteriorated as private market possibilities, the speculators and developers have moved out to the standard metropolitan statistical area with their shopping centers, their condominiums, their real estate tracks, their industrial parks, and their fast food parlors. In Iowa, this process has been at work, <clears throat> and a spokesman for one of the larger developers in the state, I must say a <clears throat> firm heavily uh, inundated with Grinnell College alumni, General Growth Properties. A spokesman for that firm recently announced that in Iowa, the new markets seem to be the middle-sized towns, the larger cities having uh, been developed. Although the question of Sioux City is unclear for General Growth Properties, because in Sioux City, uh, the city uh, under a major downtown maintenance project, uh, a $10 million uh, effort to save the central downtown area, um, passed a zoning ordinance prohibiting shopping center development on the perimeter of the city, uh, but general growth in its inimitable privatistic way is suing Sioux City for the right to uh, build its shopping center. Privatism then, like the anonymous forces and privatism isn't so anonymous. Uh, I know who those people are. Privatism, then, like the anonymous forces of demography, technology, class, and race, limits the possibility of maintaining cities as effective communities and humane environments in this country, as central places where some kind of a civic humanism might flourish. Under the pressure of such forces, it may well be doubted whether major American cities can survive the 20th century. I don't think there's any doubt about Grinnell or Ames, but I think the question of Chicago uh, is very serious. This conclusion, I think, cannot be accepted uh, by the historian or the humanist. Um, and this is a bit of whistling in the dark. History, I think, is not 
a determined closed result of anonymous forces and processes. It is an open prospect in which humans make conscious choices and have the potential for individual action. Anybody who is a humanist has to believe that. We are still rural and pre-industrial. We have only 27 communities over 10,000 people in this state. Only two over 100,000. Highways and motor cars and trucks and shopping center developers are all around us, just as there are those who would keep our East Ends powerless, poorly educated and unemployed. But the prospect in Iowa is good, I would think, for cities as effective communities. It remains a matter of choice. Technology will not create such communities, nor will the private market, nor will the government, but individuals can. The fall of public man may have occurred. The rise of public woman is just beginning. <laughs> Without being either facetious or sentimental about such matters, I think it fair to conclude by noting some thoughts of Henry Adams on the historian uh, on this topic of the possible rise of public woman. Henry Adams, at the end of the 19th century, uh, was bothered very much by the deterministic process of history, uh, by, by forces sort of out of control. He looked for leverage on those processes. Uh, and I think one thing he looked at was the future of uh, woman. He had this feeling that, <clears throat> taking analogies from physics, the second law of thermodynamics and laws of acceleration, principles of inertia, that the historical process is a process in which things with great inertia uh, uh, acquire momentum gradually, and, and then history changes. History does change. I guess that's the point. History isn't a determined and closed system. Uh, well, Adams discussed woman as a, a powerful inertial force, uh, quiescent for centuries, capable of awakening to consciousness and power, and when once awakened, capable of exerting a new influence on the historical process, capable of getting leverage on it, capable of changing it. Now, I'm not at all sure that is happening, but it does illustrate the point I want to make, that history is an open, <clears throat> not a closed system, that it is not a necessary and determined process, that change occurs, <clears throat> and that one of these changes occurring in our own time and whose results we cannot yet imagine is a change in the consciousness of women. And what is true of women can be true of men, just as what is true of the process of history is true about the process of urbanization. It, too, is an open and undetermined affair where the consciousness of men and women may have its effect. Up till now, after all, cities have been made by privatistic men, not public women. Perhaps our cities in their present form need to die or be reborn or be succeeded by something better. Public women might produce a new and better generation of cities. Public women and two dollars a gas, two dollars a gallon gasoline. Thus the appropriateness of Janet Abu Lugud's cry, the city is dead, long live the city. <laughs>